The School of Public Policy at the University of Calgary has released a new study on barriers to clean energy uh, technology adoption. So we're going to talk to one of the authors, economist Kent Fellows, about that study. Welcome to the interview, Kent. Pleasure to be here. Well, look, why don't we start with an overview of the study, please? Sure. So what we were looking into is really um, how do clean technologies get financing? So this is both at the startup stage and also at the scale up stage. So thinking about, you know, base level R&D to actually spend money to develop a technology. And then once it's developed, how do you get it from sort of the bench stage into full commercialization? And not just how do you do it, but when does it make sense to do it? So we're really looking at this from kind of a capital market funding perspective. What's the role of government? What's the role of sort of venture capital, what's the role of, of commercial markets, that kind of stuff. Now, I did an interview with Laura Kilcrease from Alberta Innovates a couple of weeks ago, where they're starting up in a, an, an incubator or in a, a transition accelerator for, to address this very question, because uh, apparently, according to Alberta Innovates, Alberta has uh, their startups don't get to the medium or large size companies as quickly as others, and, and capital is a big part of that issue. So what role does capital play in the process? Well, I mean, it's really important, right? I mean, that's how you're how you're getting the money together because by its very definition, um, new innovation doesn't generate uh, a revenue stream until you're getting to the more commercial stages. So you need to figure out how you support that through uh, one of the phrases is the valley of death. How do you go from uh, through this period where you've got net negative cash flows? And so we've looked into sort of what role can government play um, because you do get a lot of funding through government agencies, Alberta Innovates being one of them, Emissions Reduction Alberta being another one in this province. And, you know, there's a handful of others, depending on the space you're in. Um, but it's, it's really this last jump that once you've got that government funding together, if you've got it together, how do you then go from there to the full market? Because the government isn't and really shouldn't be in a position of propping these up long term. You know, at some point, you've got to kick the innovation out of the nest and, and see if it can fly on its own. So one of the things that we pinpointed as a potential issue here is really in the signaling. Later stage funders are always looking to earlier stages to try to figure out how much risk there is involved in a particular investment and how it fits into their portfolio. And too often what we're hearing is government money is kind of treated as, uh, and it's a derogatory term, but dumb money, money that's invested without doing due diligence, which just isn't true. Uh, ERA does due diligence and, and uh, Alberta Innovates does due diligence. I mean, you know, from watching the space, I'm sure these agencies do spend a lot of time figuring out where best to put their money. And so one of the things that we picked up on as a, as a, a good policy uh, to advance is really thinking more seriously about that signaling role. Uh, how does government funding signal to the private market that uh, they've made a smart bet? Yeah, that's an interesting question because I've been talking to uh, invest, uh, uh, investors and uh, uh, financiers over the last little while, and and the and these are Alberta-based uh, folks, and they tell me that uh, there is an incredible appetite amongst investors, provincially, nationally, and even internationally, to find clean tech, clean energy companies. So there's no question that there's a, an appetite, that capital is available. And it, there's no question that there are plenty of startups with, with great technology, great IP, that, uh, but somehow there seems to be a disconnect here. Yeah, so I think one of the issues is that that signaling, you know, d does the government agency money actually signal quality? Another thing that we found in our own research is uh, regulatory certainty plays a big role here as well. And you see this, especially, uh, you know, we, we have a, a recent news story, the, the federal conservative uh, climate plan, right, their plan for, for carbon pricing and, and um, you know, they're supportive of a large emitters price, which is good, uh, but they want a lower price than, than the liberal one, uh, the liberal plan currently in place. And if you're an investor in this space, that can make you nervous because depending on the outcome of the next election, if part of the return on your investment in clean tech is avoiding that carbon payment, well, by slashing the carbon payment, you've just destroyed part of the market for clean tech innovation. So we've seen that in Alberta with the with the political handovers, and we see that federally. And so it's a it's a tricky one to get around. But but I think governments, if they're serious about attracting this kind of investment, have to think about what's the policy durability and is there a durability for a market here if you're avoiding carbon emissions uh, that kind of thing 
Kent, is it fair to say that there might be a policy disconnect between the Alberta government uh, and, you know, you mentioned the CPC uh, opposition uh, federally, and what's going on in other countries? Because, uh, you know, you were seeing this greater climate ambition at the policy level, you know, down in the U.S., we're seeing it in Europe, we're even seeing it in Asia and in, in China and, and other countries. And, and when governments send the wrong signal, the wrong message to investors, as you say, that makes, that makes them nervous. You're out of step with, uh, with other jurisdictions. I mean, I don't think we're necessarily that much more guilty of it than a, than a lot of other jurisdictions. I mean, the United States uh, probably has some whiplash in their climate policies with the recent turnover in administration there. So I think this is, you know, a problem elsewhere. Um, it's easy to think about clean tech as, you know, its own little space, but it's competing for capital with other sectors, right? I mean, the IT sector, you know, you, you look at advancements in blockchain and that kind of stuff coming out of IT, they're competing at some level for the same type of, of capital funding in the capital market that, uh, that the clean tech space is. And so, yeah, I think we do have a problem with durability. I'm not sure we're a whole lot worse than a lot of the other jurisdictions, but it's definitely something to think about seriously going forward that, you know, at, at some point, uh, if we actually want to attract this, we have to get out of this four year cycle a little bit and and, and have some policy durability. And, and in fact, I mean, I, I was criticizing the, the federal conservative plan for having a different carbon price. It is nice that they've now sort of come around to the idea of having a large emitters uh, carbon price. That's a win. And, and that is more durability than, than we had in the past, but, but potentially not enough if someone's interested in that difference between sort of $50 and $170 on a, on a cost per ton for greenhouse gas emissions. Well, one of the concerns I've heard, uh, Kent, is that um, if capital isn't available and if there are too many barriers to uh, these kind of startups, you know, getting bigger, you know, growing their market and getting bigger, one of the things they do is move to other jurisdictions. And we've seen, for instance, you know, Green Power Motors uh, out of Vancouver, you know, is now opened up, uh, moved a lot of its operations down to the US. We see the same, similar things with New Flyer out of Manitoba, electric buses, right? And, and that's gotta be concerning, uh, you know, to policymakers for sure, but all of us really, that we spend money nurturing these companies and then because they can't get access to that capital or there are other barriers, then they have to move and they take jobs with them and, and other economic opportunities. Have I, have I got that right? Yeah, I mean, I, th I think so. Um, in this paper, we were more focused on looking at the oil and gas sector specifically. Um, but if you think about growing those business, yeah, start up and scale up and, and having that translation is really important, right? And, and um, I mean, some economists may call it rent seeking that we want to keep the, the economic growth here, but, but we kind of do, especially if it's our government agencies that are that are paying for this startup, and then someone else gets the benefits of the scale up. Um, widespread adoption, you know, getting other places to adopt your technology is really critical if you're doing it correctly, um, because you can get those licensing fees, you can repatriate some of that value. Um, and so I think, you know, thinking about fostering these longer term, and again, just the stability issue, rather than, you know, every couple of years, we're, we're rejigging funding agreements or, or something like that. Um, another point that, that we made in the paper that's related is the issue between funding projects versus funding companies. Um, and this can become a really big issue because if you're funding a project, then the project proponent uh, has a, a real strong incentive to try to keep that project going as long as they can, right? Because they're benefiting from the funding. If they cancel it, it gets cut. Whereas if you're funding at a firm level, they have a bit more freedom to, to reallocate, okay, this one's not working, but we have another uh, area of R&D over here that is working so we can move those funds around. And so I think thinking about that in, in terms of how to foster this is more of a, an atmosphere and environment domestically, rather than thinking about trying to pick specific projects that are winners um, is probably key to a winning strategy here. Uh, Kent, any final thoughts on, on barriers and, and what we can, uh, you know, what our provincial and federal government can do uh, to overcome those? Yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, it's always funny to say this as an economist, I think throwing money at the problem probably will help, which is usually not a message we want to get out there. I mean, uh, you know, you don't want to just be throwing money at problems. But I think that is paired with advice that you have to do it 
properly. And so in the paper, we've laid out a lot of the strategy on how to do that, or at least how, how we think that should be done, or at least pointing at some of the pitfalls on how not to do it. And it comes with really seriously thinking about a signaling strategy, showing that the money you're spending is based on due diligence, showing all the good work that's already being done in these agencies to vet these programs so that the private sector gets that information and can make more educated bets on where to put their money. Um, because we've got a lot of great innovation, a lot of great startup, a lot of great scale up in, in this province. Um, but them trying to demonstrate to private capital markets that these are good bets, that seems to be a big part of the challenge. So that's really the, the, the hurdle that we have to overcome that I think is the most important one. Ken, thank you very much for your insights. Always appreciate it. Always a pleasure.